Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're so excited. I'm going to say we because I believe that Melissa is going to be able to join us soon. I have to manifest that. But in the meantime, friends, as you uh, join us, feel free to in the chat box at any time, feel free to introduce yourself ask a question, uh, share an idea or a quote, um, or share our hyperlink resource for our colleagues. Um, this is an opportunity for us through this virtual mechanism, either today live or asynchronous later, to uh, stay connected as we continue to um, get more well-versed around the expansion of the UDL guidelines. So just one, uh, uh, what is it, a cautionary tale when you're in the chat and you're dropping in um, your thoughts, ideas, your name and such, just make sure, make sure you choose not just all panelists, but make sure you choose all panelists and attendees if that is um, your intent uh, for our time together. So accessibility commitments, of course, at CAS, we strive for this um, goal. We have taken steps to ensure that this deck is accessible. We use the tool to perform an automated check through Microsoft Office's accessibility checker. We also check manually to ensure a clear recording order for screen readers and users. We provided access to the deck to you. I know Patrice is dropping those in the chat. And Patrice, at any time, feel free to just let me know if something's popping um, in the chat that I would uh, be happy to connect with. Uh, that means you can personalize your experience as we speak, and we welcome any feedback for improving the experience. Alisa, can you hear me? I can hear you. Melissa, you here? Woo woo! We manifested it. <laughs> the Wi-Fi started to work right on time. Wonderful, wonderful. So, Melissa, perfect segue, friend. You want to introduce yourself to our colleagues? Sure. About sixty-nine of us uh, joined in this. Awesome! Um, Yay! So bar. excited to be here. Excited to uh, be here with Elisa. I'm coming to you live from Bennington, Vermont, where we have uh, five. I think five. And you'll stand right by me. Five of our casties. Awesome. Just finishing up, and what I was doing was school-wide implementation. So same same topic, same idea. So happy to be here. Uh, my name is Melissa Sanjay. I most often um, Zoom in from uh, near Boston, Massachusetts. But as I said, I'm in Vermont today. And I say most often a little loosely because I'm often on the road as an implementation specialist uh, implementing UDL in schools and districts and um, uh, working with teachers, district leaders, school leaders, and thinking about how do we make all of our spaces and places designed with UDL, but also how do we um, how do we support teachers to use UDL in their classrooms? And we're thinking about that school wide implementation lens. Prior to um, coming to Cast about five years ago, I was a a first aid social worker, and then a teacher, and then a principal in Boston's alternative high schools. So we had, I was in two different um, alternative high schools. Those are the high schools for the students who were, who are, one school was 14 to 21, another was 16 to 24. And um, working with um, those students for whom the traditional system did not serve. Um, so they were either pushed out or dropped out of their school. So that's kind of where I come to this passion to make schools and places and spaces and instruction and learning wherever it happens flexible um, because I saw some of my students were not able to stay with their friends and with their homeschools because um, the the flexibility wasn't there for them. So I like to say I am in the business of putting my former self out of business. So I love it. I love it. Um, thank you, Melissa. So glad you're able to hop on, friend. Um, so my name is Elisa torres Burton, and I get to uh, play often in the field with Melissa and our other Castis co uh, colleagues. Um, on, I am in North Carolina today, um, supporting a county district out here. Uh, but normally I um, zoom out of Fresno, California. I am based out of ca um, California. And my um, air quotes nine to five is a supporting county offices of education and building the capacity at the, those levels to support, uh, to create teams of implementation specialists and so that they can have the capacity to support districts if and when they're ready to do this work of implementation. Much like Melissa, she's been my uh, partner in crime along with uh, Dr. Brenda Green, another CASTI. Um, we um, are diving in deeply into that um, SIC. You'll hear us use that language today, which is a school implementation criteria. Essentially, what is the ecosystem that needs to be present in order to support UDL implementation in the classroom level and at all levels, right? 
Um, and so we are kind of geeked up. Melissa and I are the geeks uh, around on this. I know we're not alone if you're on here today. Uh, we know that yeah, that's part of your probably your love language too, right? How do we minimize barriers? How do we reduce barriers? But at the system level, because we know that um, nothing moves on its own. So our goals for today are to examine a problem of practice through the lens of the guidelines 3.0 and the school-wide implementation criteria, which from now on I'll start calling it the SIC. And so essentially, friends, we know that you come to this work usually with some in uh, some compelling why, um, either a piece of data, um, at, you know, qualitative or quantitative. Uh, sometimes we come to this work with a learner in mind, either ourselves or for me, that mom hat, right? As a mom, some of the fire in my belly about this work is because of my mom hat. Um, of course, my leadership hat and all the things. But so we thought we frame our time together thinking about one air quotes generic, because we know it's not a generic formal practice, but then we're going to tap into what might it look like to approach this uh, through the guidelines 2.2 and then the expansion of the guidelines 3.0. What might we consider differently? Again, grounded on this um, a broad problem of practice. And then we're also going to explore the implications to the expansion of the guidelines through UDL implementation. Um, so we're going to, again, invite you, we're going to look back to look forward, right? We're going to present a problem of practice. We're going to have, hopefully, we thought we thought it was broad enough that might resonate with you and or your context. And we'll look at the before and then through the expansion, what might we consider? And also, heads up, we're going to give you an opportunity to drop in in the chat. Of course, feel free at any time um, to some of your thoughts or reactions or considerations that um, would support our collective learning today. So I will pause and I'm going to invite you to consider now that we've shared our hypothesis as to what we're going to do together today, uh, what are your goals and or questions for today? So I will pause. And you don't have to put them in the chat. Feel free to doodle noodle like my daughter says, <laughs> or uh, just reflect on something you want to give your brain an idea as to what to focus on today. Um, and Jennifer asks if uh, she says she loves the accessibility commitments and asks if they're allowed to share with other people at the institution. Yes, Jennifer, you'll even get a recording. So um, you'll be able to share that recording and they will live. If you just want to send them to the CAST website, the, the recordings and materials will live on the um, on the CAST website. Great, 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 great. Oh, Aaron is part of Fairfax County. Elisa and I have been there. Oh, yes, awesome. we have. Yeah. Virginia, I remember that. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, my friend, I'm going to do a quick review and then I'm going to have us, um, you launch us to that um, video of the kiddos. Um, so a quick review of UDL, right? We we always think about these universal resources, these webinars as a as a place. There's some of you are sitting in a place that like, we already do webinars, Melissa and Elisa, we could do this. <laughs> but we also are such believers in that there should be lots of access points. And so we're going to remind us a quick review here of what is this intent of UDL. So universal design for learning is an approach to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all. We could highlight that word. We could have a slide with just the word all in there mm -hmm. um, because we know that's the aspirational and compelling reason we're here. How might we do that? We set clear, rigorous goals, anticipate barriers, and proactively design to minimize those barriers. And so the concepts, the foundational concepts or principles, and again, this might be very familiar to you, um, is that we look for barriers in the design, not the learner. We believe and, and work from a space where variability is the norm. It is contextual and it can be planned for. And we use the guidelines, right? That infamous design tool, a graphic organizer to support us in designing for all. And through the design process, we think about clearing, uh, setting clear rigorous goals, like I alluded to earlier, anticipating barriers and variability or honoring them, and then designing um, set options. So uh, Melissa, you wanna tap us into the expansion, what the focus areas are sure. for the expansion? So um, as most of you know, uh, we released our guidelines 3.0 in July, July 30th of 2024. And so the, the guidelines are meant to expand. We realize that there are certain areas and certain considerations that we were not thinking about when we were designing. So we wanted to expand them. And so our main expansions are, we are um, emphasizing identity as part of learner variability. So we still have all the other variabilities that we talked about. And we're adding identity as part of you as a part of learner variability. 
What I and, love about that, Melissa, not to interrupt, but I know we're going to do this the next hour or so. <laughs> that piece <laughs> of identity, right? What What is so compelling about identity is because we were thinking about the what, the why, and the how, but the who, right? It was implied, but now is explicit. Like, might we consider the who as part of learner variability? Yeah, and a lot of this is to be more explicit about yes. including um, those cultural variabilities and linguistic variabilities and racial variabilities mm -hmm. and be very explicit about it mm -hmm. um, as we give teachers things to pay attention to and things to consider when designing. And part of that consideration is thinking about individual, institutional, and systemic bias as a barrier. And this, a lot of that, a lot of those pieces live in this SIC work, in this school-wide implementation criteria work, taking those equity pauses and really thinking about, am I thinking about everybody who isn't represented, who, who isn't um, showing up here in this work? Um, the third is to emphasize the value of interdependence and collective learning. So what we mean by that is we, we didn't emphasize that as much before, and we want to really emphasize that, that learning together space for teachers and for, for students and for all learners. And then we shifted our language a little bit from uh, teacher-centered language to learner-centered language. So we want these guidelines to be able to be used aspirationally by both teachers and learners. And on that slide, you'll see some full drafts, the graphic organizer, one pager, and uh, a, another webinar about UDL guidelines 3.0 that can kind of, if you're interested in diving a little bit deeper, and all that stuff is also on our website. For sure. So as Melissa and I were thinking about how to launch this, we and when in doubt, we think about our is our work, is the, the development of the webinar, the design, is it centered around student voices? Um, you want to give a little background, Melissa, as to why we um, love this um, video that we're about to share. So we were trying to think about what are the systemic barriers to um, to, to learner agency, right? Because that's another big theme in our guidelines 3.0, moving from expert learner to learner agency. So what are the barriers that keeps learners from showing up to the learning as their whole selves and really mm -hmm. owning that and moving through it? And so these are um, stories from young people who were in traditional schools that did not work for them. And they ended up um, going to what New York City calls the transfer schools. We call them in Boston alternative schools or educational options. But those schools for students for whom traditional traditional um, schools didn't work. And they're gonna to talk to us from in their own voices about some of the barriers they faced in those schools. Seventh grade, I was homeless. My mom was addicted to drugs, never met my dad. I was 10 years old, taking care of like five kids. I came from the Dominican Republic. I didn't know the English language. I have dyslexia, as well as like a, English is my second language. So I would get pulled out of classes. I was in fifth grade, um, and then they realized I actually didn't finish the fourth grade. I remember vividly, they came upstairs and they're like, actually, she has to go back downstairs. So I was picked up midway through the day and they're like this is your new class and no one really explained to me why I was moving classes. The high school that I went to was in a really really terrible neighborhood like gun violence was almost every day. My first high school had metal detectors and it felt really uncomfortable being patted the way I was every morning. It was so invasive constantly just to get to school. I was intimidated to go to school from just the police officers. We would be in these common spaces and fights would break out. So you'd get arrested if you got into a fight with no context. I'm used to having like teachers that are predominantly white and they're like, well, I get paid whether you do the work or not. So, I mean, I don't care. Classrooms were too big. If you didn't know something, you just had to figure it out or ask somebody else and see if they knew something. If they didn't know, then you both didn't know. It. It's just, you had to just basically fend for yourself. So it made us kind of step back and be like, oh, okay. like. They just gonna let us do whatever we want. You're just thrown textbooks or like a little Chromebook and you're told to go on Google Classroom and 
do the work, and then that's it. It's just, it's just pass or fail. The classes were an hour and a half long. The teachers didn't know my name. I barely met with my guidance counselor. I don't even think she knew my name. I didn't know my counselors. I didn't know the principal of those schools. I mean, I was doing terrible. Like, my grades were low. I was always cutting. Some days I would wake up and I just didn't want to go to school because I'm struggling. I got to fight for answers, I gotta fight for help. Some days I just woke up and I just didn't go. There was even times that I would cut school, go to the football field and climb over the fence just to smoke. And nobody ever found me. So we're not trying to depress anybody <laughs> or discourage. It's just that is, um, that is the lift right? That is the lift. So as you think about systems through the lens of UDL, we're going to invite you to consider these four domains, uh, school culture, teaching and learning, leadership and management, and professional learning. So I want to pause here to invite you to share in the chat or consider what systemic barriers have you seen related to honoring identity? We heard the children talk a bit about that, addressing bias, this idea of collective learning, and learner center practices. What have you witnessed or is your lived experience around these areas? So what barriers have you seen and or what um, design options or solutions have you witnessed as well? Mm -hmm. So Allison said poverty is a barrier, Melissa on the chat, and Elif, hopefully I'm saying your name correctly. Otherwise, I just say like a Dominican would say it. <laughs> <laughs> Addressing barriers. Addressing bias, yeah. Uh, excuse me, bias. Yes, thank you. Elif, all right. Elif, correct. Yeah. It was Elif, but it's, okay. it's all good. Ashley, lack of support from instructors, controlling and restrictive languages and policies. Language, that's, yeah, that's a big one. The system it's itself okay. is a barrier, yep. Can be, yeah. Citizenship and immigration status to post-secondary. So the system around getting into post-secondary institutions. Yeah. Deficit thinking. Defining students by placement categories and mm. making judgments. Not, not identifying that variability, right? Because mm -hmm. placement categories have tons of variability within them. So uh, Iran has seen exemplifying learner-centered practices. That's awesome. Shortage of facilities, shortage of resources. How we define and measure progress, learning and improvement. Resources, money, understanding, and so much more. Yeah. I feel like Melissa, we're on the air quotes right track of what we hypothesize yeah. this slide, this this opportunity together, not just the slide deck. But we're gonna um, share with you as I started at the beginning of our time together is this this way of looking at how what we can control these areas that we can control and how we can use universal design for learning and and the aspirational tenets of UDL um, to make uh, some moves around this work. So. Um, just like um, we think about the guidelines being super supportive, or we call them a design tool in supporting classroom instruction, the school-wide implementation criteria thinks about or considers ways of, of increasing access, right, that leads to a learner agency at the system level. So some cross-cutting concepts that live between both the UDL guidelines and the SIC is that there's pieces that are intentionally woven into these domains and elements. So they're both going after creating equitable, inclusive, and accessible environments and practices, honoring variability, right? That is at the core, reducing barriers and bias in the environment, designing for learner agency, and engaging in data and an empathy-driven iterative improvement, and fostering collaboration and collective ownership of learner access and agency. So in other words, think about it this way, the guidelines are supporting the classroom piece. Of course, as a site leader, of course you're welcome, you can use the UDL guidelines themselves, right? That's part of the, of the work we do through professional learning and supporting leaders um, model this at a staff meeting, how we engage with community partners and such. But the SIC is gonna support us at that system level, thinking about barriers in that way. 
So yeah. we we'll often talk about, go ahead, Melissa, I can't see your face, friends. So just jump on whenever you, <laughs> it's going to be yeah. like with on the phone, old school back in the 80s. I hope others can see my face. It's just your arrangement, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, um, I'm hoping nobody's told me otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> tell us in the chat if I'm talking from a we'll dark. We'll see what world. happens. Yeah, yeah. go for yeah, it. And as I see, just really thinking about those cross-cutting concepts, supporting all of our spaces and places to design for variability. Yeah. To, uh, and how do we support teachers in their classrooms at, yeah. at uh, implementing UDL so that learners have agency and access in their learning? For sure. And so when we talk about barriers, when we're, we're thinking about classrooms, we think about the methods, materials, assessment, and environment, and those goals, right? Those buckets, we call them those buckets. I call them the four plus one buckets from right? thinking about how the material is represented, how the content is delivered, how the learning is being demonstrated, that climate culture, and of course, grounded in the goal. At the system level, we look at these four buckets, school culture and environment, teaching and learning, leadership and management, and professional learning. In other words, regardless of what's happening in the classroom, right, there's implications to, as leaders, right, sitting in that leadership seat, to school culture and environment, teaching and learning, leadership and management, and professional learning. And my um, awesome buddy, Bill, uh, I think it was Bill or Neon, I don't know which of the two, but both can take credit, woo -woo. <laughs> is that all of this is in service of teaching and learning. All of, the, all of these moves, right, are in service of teaching and learning. There's no real hierarchy per se, but we also know that things don't happen in a vacuum. So what we're going to do today is we're going to think about how might we minimize uh, barriers from the classroom to the systems level. So as promised, here is a broad uh, problem of practice. Um, so students are underperforming and open response questions on the math assessments in our school. I have yet, Melissa, I don't know about you, but I've yet to visit a school that says we're nailing it in math. We have it all figured out. Please come and uh, copy paste what we're doing here. Uh, math is a challenge. And as a former high school math teacher, I there's so much of this uh, resonates. But so what, how might we look at, right? How might we deconstruct this problem of practice through a lens that allows us to use the guidelines and the expansion, right? We're connecting it to the expansion um, in a different way, in an expanded way, okay? So, all right, so thinking about the barrier, it could be that currently the students are under, under uh, scoring on that particular area. It could be that the text of an open response question is only available on paper. Right, mm -hmm. only available on paper. We know that that could be a barrier. So some of the results could be that some learners may not be able to see the question, right? Some learners may not be able to decode. So as we looked at the 2.2 guidelines, we thought, okay, so what would be a way to minimize those barriers? Well, it'd be great if we offer alternatives for visual information. And so we may have offered uh, text to speech options and audio version of problems, right? There's lots of ways that in systems we've heard about offering more um, alternatives to visual information. So what might be the plus one, Melissa, as I'm thinking about, as we are all thinking about from the 2.2 to the 3.0 expansion, how might we look at this particular problem of practice? As, so we, yeah, as we go through, go um, as we go through the, the UDL guidelines 3.0 um, expansions, we really think about like, what are the other things that we need to consider? Mm -hmm. We've been considering that, that perception barrier around yeah. things. We can't I'll go back to show that. Go ahead. We can't customize the, the, the display. We don't have alternatives for visual. But then when we go to our 3.0 perception guideline, we will see um, an additional guideline there that is um, to represent a diversity of perspectives and identities in authentic ways. So is it possible that the open response questions are only representative of the majority culture. And as a result, the students can't see themselves in the question. Mm, preach. And so what are the options that we can design for that from a 3.0 lens as we can make sure to vary um, the curate or write math problems from a diversity of perspectives and maybe even go back up to that um, welcoming interest and identities um, guideline and think about giving students choice in that. Yeah, so I wish we'd go back and forth, but I think we're just sharing the process today, Melissa, about going back and forth and to what extent the, the guidelines um, expand for us. So let's go to another example. So let's say, okay, it could have been back to that same problem of math, right, problem of practice. It could have been that the language and syntax of open response is dense and it's hard to decipher, right? We know there's vocabulary just in general, and there is, of course, there's content related of language that might be critical. And it could be that some learners may not be able to understand what the question is asking. 
And so it could have been that we, at first, we could have thought about, oh, well, how might we support decoding of text, mathematical notation, and symbols? Therefore, one option we could have considered is to teach a consistent routine for analyzing open response questions. And so as I pass the baton back to Melissa, we're not suggesting that we no longer do that, right? The expansion is literally that language of is expanding um, something else that we might do in support of learners. So through that lens of 3.0, Melissa. So other things to consider, right? Um, the language of the math problem might not be in the heritage language of all learners, and there's no translation options available. But the result is the piece here. If we look at that result, the result is the same. The result mm -hmm. is some learners may not be under, able to understand what the question is asking. Mm -hmm. So when we, when we see that our learners are not able to understand what the question is asking, we have more than one place to look because there may be more than one barrier, right? So in this case, we might need to cultivate understanding and respect across language and dialects or address bias in the use of language and symbols as it relates to our, our willingness to offer translation options to our students. So we might have the problems in multiple languages or provide translation opportunities or even provide um, translation dictionaries, have a sheet that has typical math words translated or key math words translated different ways to um, cultivate that respect across uh, languages and address bias in the use of language and symbols. I love it. And so Melissa, what this, as a, as a former, I still consider myself a math teacher. As a math teacher, what I feel like, I thought the guidelines 2.0 was already giving me a superpower as a, as a designer thinking about, because um, I remember I shared this often in rooms that I felt like I was a rock star engagement teacher because I never liked math. I had a horrible experience in math in high school. And so I thought when I became a math teacher, I'm like, I'm going to make it fun and engaging and relevant. But there was components of it that I was not addressing, right? Language and symbols was one of the areas that it could have been um, more intentionally designed. And so this 3.0 is beefing up even that approach of thinking, wow, couldn't we provide a scaffold or a point of connection, right? Where the children and the learners can see themselves even in the context of a discipline like math. So I really appreciate those connections you're, um, you're making for us with math. All right, so um, the other piece I will say um, before we segue to the last example using the guidelines and then the 3.0 is that you, you came, you logged on today because of the um, thinking about through the lens of leadership. So as we're going through these examples and possible options, and we know that these are not the only options, consider or think about what might the system component or in tandem might need to be in place or be developed to be intentionally considered in order to support these practices. So I love the question you always ask, Elisa. Go ahead. How, I love the question you always ask. How is your system responding? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does yeah. your system respond yeah. to this, to these, yeah, absolutely. To these problems? Yeah, because we always, we often get the question, Melissa, about like, what does UDL look like? And is there a walkthrough tool? Is this, this or that? And kind, kind of, well, the guidelines is a design tool, but what's more critical, right, from the leadership lens is how does your system respond to variability, right? In any bucket, pick any bucket from the parking lot to the restrooms, to the classrooms, to the bank, to the community, to the boardroom, in what ways your system, like it's as, as fluid and effectively as we can respond to variability, that's what UDL looks like, right? That's what we're going after. Okay, so we could go about this all day, Melissa, but <laughs> all right, last, last bit, um, and then we'll take that same problem of practice and look at the SIC. So uh, students are required to solve the problems independently, often the case in mathematics, and so the result might be that some learners may not be engaged in the learning, right? There's, a, there's times because of a variability being contextual where we're ready to talk to a colleague, to a neighbor, to a student around a math problem, but then sometimes we have to work on our own. So, okay, it could be that we offer choice of word problem to solve. Um, could have been one way, in other words, to support optimizing individual choice and autonomy. So the 3.0 um, perspective, the expansion of the guidelines, Melissa, what would we say? Uh, the barrier students are required to solve the problems independently. Yeah. Same result. Yes. Some learners may not be engaged in the learning, right? But now we're thinking about, is it, is it we're having another consideration. Mm -hmm. Possibly under foster collaboration, interdependence, and collective learning or foster belonging and community. Is that where the, where the barrier and the option lives? And should we offer both options for independent and collaborative practice um, when we're practicing building our understanding of these open response questions. Yeah. 
And so, Melissa, what if there's a yeah, but in the room? Um, and that is often like, yes, we're on board, but don't our students have to solve a problem independently? Like, don't at some point? Um, yeah. Absolutely. We're going to have to in real life, whatever that means real, because <laughs> it's their real life right now. Well, um, I always felt like real life to me. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Sometimes we have to do things on our own and sometimes we have to do things collaboratively. And so being very intentional about that, being very intentional about that. Okay. So sometimes let's collaboratively build our understanding so that yes. we can perform independently. Preach. Preach. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And wouldn't it be great if the kids could choose, right? Based on what their brain needs and their heart needs at the moment. Wouldn't it be great? Um, agency moment. All right. So Les, that was using the guidelines and the expansion to consider a problem of practice. I'm just talking through the idea of the barrier. And notice too that Melissa and I are taking the time to talk about what the result, the implications are. In other words, we know there might be a barrier considering, thinking about, right? What happens if we double down on this barrier? That is critical to shifting practice, okay, leaders? So we know that we have to create, there's the knowing doing gap and that could be a whole other webinar. And so as we we're expanding on our knowing and connecting to the doing, one of the ways that we can support uh, shifts in practice is to consider what is the result by uh, us um, just pretending that barrier is not there. So let's okay. shift to the system level. Um, students, again, still the same problem of a practice, right? You're thinking about what's happening in the classroom and in the ecosystem that supports it. So students are underperforming open response questions on the math assessment at our school. So it could oh. be, go ahead, Melissa, feel free to jump in front because I can't see you. <laughs> um, so I was going, just going to say that the, yeah. that math classroom or those math classrooms, that math wing, of yeah. our school are not operating in a vacuum. They're operating mm -hmm. in a system. They're operating in a culture. So yeah. when we think about school culture and environment, where mm -hmm. could potential barriers sit in a, in a school that would impact students underperforming on open response questions and math assessments? So potentially school classroom and cultures don't support identifying tools mm -hmm. that work best for each individual or it doesn't fully communicate the value and possibility of variability. Maybe we don't support public practice, experimentation and feedback. And then what does 3.0 give us? That's what our little green plus signs for. What does 3.0 give us as we think about systems? Mm -hmm. Maybe our school culture does not support identifying, designing for identity and diverse perspectives. And that's where we end up with those barriers around, I can't see myself in the math problem, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I can- How is this connected to who I am? That's what you said as an identity, right? Like, oh. is there a space for me to show up in my whole self in the context of mathematics or in the context of anything of my um, education experience, for sure. So we're really trying to think about these 3.0 guidelines mm -hmm. and the main ideas around identity, barriers, collective learning, learner agency and how does the system adjust to support mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. things that's happening in the classroom to kind of get out of the way right melissa isn't that what we talked about to kind of just yeah. get out of the way let the whole child yeah so here's an opportunity for um for us to pause melissa and i to um just take a moment and give you an opportunity to reflect um as you think about the shifts necessary um around this idea of school culture and environment one of those um, sic domains um, what might be necessary in order to honor identity, bias, collective learning, and learner-centered practices? So we inv invite you to go beyond the math problem of practice that we're just using to uh, center our conversation today. Um, what might be necessary around the school culture and environment component? Go ahead and throw that in the chat. What are you thinking, Elisa? What's coming to your mind? I feel like for school culture and, and environment, it's so much about practicing what we preach outside of the construct of the classroom environment, right? So um, there's one um, protocol we often use when we do data dives around um, mapping out where our kids feel safe on our campus, right? Okay. Or their perception of how they feel on our campus. Literally take a school map and ask your uh, learners and your teachers and your parents, their vibe, how they feel around their, their campus. It'd be interesting to see what we learn um, because I have my own person, my, my own worldview informs what I consider as identity, what I, what my biases are, what I assume is collective learning. And so I think about like, how will I gather the data um, that'll calibrate um, our current reality and that what we're working towards around school culture and environment. 
Yeah. And Claudia is saying something very similar. First, creating a sense of belonging for all. Mm. Yes. Ron is talking about thinking intentionally about the wording inside mm -hmm. of the resources and assessments. And that intentionality is key to UDL. We intentionally reduce barriers. What we intentionally design using the guidelines, using the SIC to reduce those barriers. So really interrogating our systems and thinking about intentionality. Growth mindsets at all levels. Preach, Maria. Absolutely. Shift from traditional teaching, less lecture, getting to know your students. Stop worrying about the fact that college doesn't allow collective practice. <laughs> <laughs> A culture of learning, variability as an asset. That's mm -hmm. what Cameron's telling us. Yeah. Unique and trust and capabilities. Yeah, like that. Trust in the unique capacities of every learner, right? Presumed yeah. competence. Mm hmm all right, Melissa, let's go to um, barriers in teaching and learning. Still thinking about that problem of practice in math, but of course, we're going to offer an opportunity to reflect from any context. All right. So what might be some barriers in our systems around teaching and learning? Maybe we don't have that vertical or um, horizontal alignment, and there's no consistent approach to problem solving. So I'm going from third grade to fourth grade, and I have to learn a new, a new protocol for how to respond to those open response questions. Maybe the goals are not clear. I'm not sure why I'm doing this problem. I'm not sure what I'm learning. I'm not sure what I'm going for. It's possible the development of reading, writing, and math skills are not well coordinated across grades, across classrooms. And then that 3.0 expansion, maybe protocols for solving problems collectively do not exist. So we don't know how to get together and you harness the power of collective learning because there's no protocol for it. Uh, we don't have a system to make that work. So my head goes straight, Melissa, to um, when I think about teaching and learning, like our professional learning communities, or what we often call PLCs, Yeah, that idea of a protocol is critical because then it's not so much about uh, a preference. Uh, instead, it's about a way that we're going to go about creating these systems and structures. Um, the other yet <laughs> land um, to this is that some of the things we've noted here um, is that problem solving, it is not just a uh, mathematics uh, consideration, right? We know that that is a very broad interdisciplinary um, uh, skill set. And so that idea of collectively doing it, wouldn't that be interesting? Go ahead, my friend. Well, it'll just to say that protocols um, keep people safe. Mm -hmm. They balance voices. They keep the goals at the center. So really, and they help students de develop those social skills and the interdependent learning skills so that maybe when they're in a group project later on in life, they can kind of come up with the the way to work themselves. But those protocols will really help them sort of match. And also it, it responds to variability because if students can choose roles and all of that, mm -hmm. it's not everybody is going to want to be the reporter. Not everybody is going to want to be the note taker. Right. So right. it helps to also respond to variability. Yeah. So Sherry shared, um, say that three times fast, um, beyond not having a system for collective learning, there are many school cultures where individualism is held, individualism is held as the norm and the best way to be, right? And sometimes and that's- the most rigorous, right? The most yeah. rigorous learning. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. We could do a whole other thing on our biases and how that informs um, the work. Yeah. All right, friends, you've already started. So here we go. Here's an opportunity to think about the shifts necessary in the domain of teaching and learning to design instruction that honors identity, addresses biases, um, designs for collective learning and exemplifies learner-centered practices. What might that look like? So we gave you the nugget of PLCs and protocols and a couple of other things. What might be from your experience or what you're thinking about? Um. Joaquin is saying uh, shifting to a nurturing educational environment where students feel seen, mm -hmm. heard, and valued. And some of the ways we do that is making that space for identity, right? Representing diverse perspectives, addressing bias as it relates to modes of expression. Uh, Alexis is saying we need teacher training in these concepts, especially across grade levels and classrooms. Absolutely. And we also know, Melissa, you know, that these domains, and we want to make sure that even though we're chunking them this way for this webinar, they're not 
they're all, all interconnected, just like we talk oh. about that with the guidelines, right? Um, the climate culture is going to affect teaching and learning and teaching and learning affects yeah. climate culture. And so um, that was a, almost a problem practice as we were designing the SIC to think about where, what bucket does this go in? And, you know, uh, the pieces are not discrete. Exactly. Just learn, learning's messy. Humanity's messy. It's just how it is. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful mess. When, uh, let's see. They had students in their PLCs monthly. Shantae did. Um, mm. I designed some lessons. I love that. I love that. That's aspirational right there. Thank you, Shantae. Sure. Corey say knowing our students and their strengths, even if they don't see them and helping them realize or access them. Mm -hmm. so, training on multiple means of assessment. Yeah, Joaquin said, oh yeah, you just read that? Yeah, yeah. Is that all about the quantitative model? Yes, please. Got to triangulate our data. Hmm. Question from Jennifer. You want to read that one, Melissa? Question about collective learning, not K-12. Is it privileging collective learning at all times also an issue that's a lot of stress for introverts mm. yes that's why we would whenever possible we would give an option so um protocols for those that want to work in a group and independent time for those that want to work independently the only time we would not advocate for giving an option is if group work was the goal yeah so all of this is grounded in our goal right like no matter what the thing is um, one of the things I think about Melissa when I'm designing is like anytime I say you only have or you you will all will, which is adorable in any classroom environment, you all will. Anytime I said all <laughs> will, then I'm creating some embedding some barriers and so get ready. Um, so absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah. And then how we define collective learning, right? Like there might be a progression. Like how does a student who might be work, let's say that Melissa, the goal is collective learning. Is there a progression? Is there a continuum? How do I, as a learner who is an introvert and I'm married to one, so I totally practice this daily. <laughs> like okay. how do I know um, uh, what part of me is not, because I'm not always an introvert, right? There's different contexts okay. where we might be differently um, uh, is what I would say. Um, and maybe, you know, that graduated level of support, maybe we start with partners and yeah. We move up so there can be a partner option if you're not ready to go to the big group absolutely all right so let's go to the next domain which is leadership and management still looking at this lens of the uh, problem of practice so it could be that the schedule doesn't allow for collaborative instructional study especially between G general education and special education it could be that curriculum materials don't support multiple means of representation and action and expression it could be that there's no time for daily collaboration between general education and special education teachers, right? These are those leadership and management components that could be a barrier to us making an impact in the classroom. So what would be the plus there, Melissa? It could be that uh, we don't talk about on the leadership level addressing bias. It's not mm. leadership priority. So it's not in the forefront of our minds when we're designing spaces, spaces, or math assessments right yeah so it could be we created the structure we have the plc time we have the collaborative time and at the same time uh, it could be that that team only values let's say uh fluency how quickly learners can do math problems well there's a bias embedded in that right or it could be that we only value individualism or we only value collectivism or the word only is what's driving the train right. <laughs> right? only one way too it's, yes it's exactly. a good way to start a barrier absolutely Absolutely. All right. So let's hear from you in the field. And those of you that are watching asynchronously later, think about that leadership and management domain. What might we need to consider for a system that honors identity, addresses biases, uh, designs for collective learning, and exemplifies learner-centered practices? Melissa, as our chat um, populates, I think about, um, I had a student, um, I often had students ask me, um, where are you from? You know, like, where are you from? I never led with, I'm Dominican and I'm born and raised in New York and blah, blah, blah. I never led from that. And as I think about that piece of honoring identity, I wonder how often by not sharing more of who we are that... Mm -hmm. We were not modeling how to honor who we are. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Modeling that, that you're, 
you can, I'm showing up as my full self. You get to show yes. up as your first self. Yes. Yeah. And what courage that it took for the kid to come up and ask me, you know, you're the principal. Somebody's going to ask you, right? This high school kid's going to be <laughs> like, yeah. what did it look? I'm like, and I just never made that connection of like, oh, they not only do they care, but there, there's something that's happening the moment I would air quotes open up and share that about them. Cause I thought yeah. they were just interested in, you know, if I was a good principal or not, or if I, you know, anything else, but. Yeah. And when I think about this leadership and management domain, one of the elements of leadership and management domain is communicating your vision and commitment to UDL and UDL implementation. Mm. And um, with the 3.0 expansion, ideas around identity, ideas around bias, ideas around collective learning can be part of that sort of mm. mission and vision for UDL. UDL for what? I was just working with some leaders as they're building a leadership team and equity was at the middle of that conversation, right? So mm -hmm. in what ways is UDL going to advance our equity and how can we explain mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. to our teachers as we vision the work? Yeah, it's definitely common language, right? We always often talk about the guidelines um, are common language, um, our instruction. Um, yeah. There's definitely a space for that. So we have Shante saying the importance of SPED educators and general educators to collaborate at the district level, especially when it comes to curricular decisions, assessments, mm -hmm. and policies. Yeah, and then right after that, I think it's Felice said inclusive leadership approaches, right? So getting all diverse perspectives to collaborate on that leadership is really embedded in that SIC as well. Yeah. Inter interdependent learning on the leadership level, Elisa. Absolutely, absolutely. Like if you if we make decisions in a vacuum, well, in the K-12 setting, I'll just say, just expect some barriers. It's, what else? Elisa, can you read Pamela's? Comment. Let me see. I have Ashley. I have Ashley provide space and time for faculty and instructors to come together to learn with each other, give them an opportunity to problem to share problems of practice with each other and strategize. I think that's the collective piece you were sharing. Joaquin, understand and foster the intersection of personal growth, cross culture experience, and extrapolate that intersection into contextualized education. Easy peasy, Joaquin. That was easy. <laughs> No, but I love the idea that you're thinking about, we're, you know, we're considering like our whole selves. What does our whole selves contribute to what we're trying to do together? Oh, Pamela Yañez, Yañez, Pamela, a ver, trabajador colaborativo, colaborativo es esencial para lograr, me estás, me estás probando, Pamela. Um, I'm testing my Spanish, pero trabajo colaborativo es esencial para lograr avanzar. Absolutely. She's talking about collaborative work is essential to um, go ahead and, and move the work. Um, thank you. So glad you used your primary language, Pamela. I'm making some assumptions, but I'm assuming. <laughs> Corey's <laughs> telling us that a huge part for, for them, at, uh, he's at Mount Prospect, I know Corey, was shifting the training people teaching from our higher ups to the teachers and the mm. class, allowing us to design and address it with each other versus a mandate or a policy. So like mm. a grassroots ground up approach. It's made our staff more willing to share, adapt, try something new and help each other because you gave your teachers agency, right? They get to choose mm -hmm. their goals. They get to choose how they learn. Yes, yes. And then Sherry sharing this piece about belonging. Oh, love that word. Just think of how many times the concept of belonging has been raised today. How powerful could it be if a school includes belonging as a core part of their mission and vision? Absolutely, Sherry. Sometimes as leaders, we often shy away from things that are not measurable. Air quotes on that because we could, right? But this idea of belonging without belonging, how can I execute my agency, right? Okay, that's beautifully said. Natalia Costa, how do you see this part being implemented, especially when there's a mix international students learning a new language? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what are some ideas, uh, Melissa, about this idea of maybe the students learning a new language? Um, how might students share and contribute um, uh, when they possess the superpower of um, adding additional languages to their repertoire? Um, Contribute it as a collect in a collective learning situation is what you're wondering, Alisa or Natalia. Yeah, yeah. And there's yeah. lots of tools. There's um things that you can apps you can put on your phone that are translation tools mm -hmm. that you can teach the English speakers along with the um heritage language speakers how to use that. And you can each person can have the phone set up for them to translate from one to the other, and they could have a conversation that way using technology. Absolutely. The other part that this is not my idea. I had a colleague share is. 
um, just yesterday, Melissa um, and our team was thinking about that sometimes we consider the ways to share ideas is only by uh, words, either on paper or the written, okay. um, but how about artwork? How about, um, uh, back to Adelina's doodles and noodles, right? Like what are some other ways we could learn about each other and people can share um, what they think about, what they consider through more mechanisms than um, words, either written or spoken. Um, Perfecto Español. Thank you, uh, Pamela. Gracias. And in Saludos de Chile, there, uh, Pamela is in Chile. Uh, she's saying hello to everybody. Un placer. Okay. It's a pleasure. All right. Um, okay. So professional learning. Um, I smile at this one because, Melissa, don't you and I get brought in a lot to support unit implementation and a lot it is invested in professional learning. So we know it's critical. We know it's important. But the yes and or the yand is that we know professional learning um, is also in tandem with what's happening in the classroom and the leadership and management and the whole control church. But again, for the sake of this conversation, we're going to talk about, again, back to this problem of practice, what are some things that could have gotten in the way of supporting this, um, this math assessment component? So it could be that there's no clear, commonly understood models of inclusion. It could be there's not enough opportunity to see mix, uh, see models of practice around clear and flexible means. It could be there aren't clear protocols for instructional collaboration and study. And also, green plus sign, Melissa. <laughs> there is no professional learning around designing for equity. Mm. And so that was something that was said in the chat earlier um, to say, like, we're not having these conversations with teachers, then we can't have the expectation that they're designing using using these new expanded considerations. Absolutely. There's moments, uh, my friend, that I feel like we've talked so much about equity, right? Like a lot of us consider ourselves equity warriors and that I feel like that's the, um, the amen. Yes, we're on board, but how do we land the plane, right? Thinking about how our professional learning supports our practitioners and landing that plane about what does it what might it look like to have equity? And of course, us as UDL uh, and CAST, we just advocate that the guidelines and these tenants, right? These principles of the very being the design, not the learner, that is equity at play, right? Variability being the norm, that is equity at play. And then um, of course, this whole idea of learner agency, that is equitable, right? The moment I make decisions for my learners and I am the only one making decisions for my learners, then I might, how I think about it, Melissa, is that I, like I'm building in some barriers because I'm thinking that I know what's better for you. Um, so as we think about professional learning, how do we support um, our, our colleagues and our system, right? How do we become a learning organization? Again, that could be all the webinar. Um, as a learning organization, how do we design for equity and everything um, that we are touching, everything that we're touching? So it's not just theory but some practical ways. Nice. Okay. So thinking about reflecting in this domain, um, think about what are the necessary shifts in the domain of professional learning to support identity, bias, collected learning, and learner center practices. Of course, Melissa and I would advocate that the design process, the UDL design process of identifying, um, you know, having clear goals and then honoring that variability and the designing ways to minimize goals, to, excuse me, to minimize barriers is one practical way um, um, how about you, Melissa, while the chat, chat populates? Practical way to, uh, in, to embed those into professional learning. I mm -hmm. think, I think using those as we, as we model our professional learning, right? Modeling for teachers, how in my professional learning, I'm going to design for collective and independent mm -hmm. learning. That's I'm true. going to yeah. kind of amplify learner center practice how I will address bias and and hold it up. I love the word address bias. Mm -hmm. And that's what the guidelines, the new guidelines say, mm -hmm. is they say address bias. They don't say eliminate. Yep. It's part of our neuroscience. It's part of the way our brains are made to make shortcuts. But we stop, we recognize, and then we do something about it, like address bias. We hold it up, we name it. And then we do something about it. And so how can we model that as we do professional learning with our teachers and honor their identity, bringing yeah. their identity. So some of the new checkpoints around honoring identity in our professional learning, you, um, cultivating joy in play is a way to honor identity. Offering uh, content from diverse perspectives is another way to honor identity. So those identity ideas are throughout the expanded guidelines. So Cheryl Blankman share, nothing about me without me is for everyone. Beautifully said. All right, wonderful. We're coming to the end of our time. 
Uh, Maria Aceituno, allowing space to make some mistakes that it will negatively impact their jobs. Absolutely. That safety That's piece, right? Great. Which ties to culture, ties to culture for sure. Yeah. It's critical. So as you collectively, uh, right, we've had you uh, at the grain size of the domains reflect on what are some of the shifts. Uh, we invite you to give your brain an opportunity to think holistically. What might have affirmed your thinking today? Like, heck yeah, we're on the right track. Uh, we're pursuing the right things and right air quotes on that. What might have pushed your thinking, like some a plus one that you're taking away today that you thought, oh, okay, I didn't consider it, or, or this is there's some cognitive dissonance happening here. But it might, and also, what might your learners need you to do next? Um, you don't have to respond in the chat. Feel free to just chew on that. Um, but we invite you to consider those. Elif said, when we are our we and our systems are not aware of the barrier. Not all educators open their minds to professional development that aims to design for equity. Is there any way teachers can be monitored and provided feedback on how inclusive their practices are? I leave, I would say you ask the teachers, right? The best type of feedback, right, is to ask the practitioner how might they, um, what, how, what might inform how they design equitably and how will they monitor that? Because um, the moment I monitor it, then I am putting my own lens on that. How about and you? I, find, I find that the UDL guidelines themselves or mm -hmm. the, or even the SIC, but in this case, probably the UDL guidelines can be something that can be outside of both of us mm -hmm. that we can discuss. Because we, if we were implementing UDL, we've already agreed that this, this set of design considerations are what we should be thinking about mm -hmm. when we're designing instruction. So then we can look at those UDL guidelines and say, okay, so where do we think there's a barrier. Have you considered this consideration? You can start to highlight ones that you might not have seen um, and see what the teacher's thinking around um, how they're designing for that particular consideration. And they might they might um, bring up something that you weren't aware of. Exactly. Yeah. So you've got two options at least. Not there's more than two options, but definitely the one that considered if there's an agreement around the guidelines, and if there hasn't even begun to be an agreement around the guidelines, then thinking about. How do, what are their perception or their where they're at around this idea of equitable um, designing for equity? Okay, so we have extra resources for you. There's graphic organizers in six languages. There's the research page link, the FAQs and the changes if you wanted to see, like I wanna say it's three or four pages of showing from 2.2 to 3.0. We also have a rationale for the document, uh, excuse me, rationale document to describe each update. November 4th, I cannot believe we're talking about November already, Melissa. Um, there's a universal design for learning 3.0 essential updates and practical applications in the context of representation. That'll be November 4th. And then um, learn with us, get in touch for more information to learn on professional learning um, offerings. And then Melissa, you want to speak to this other webinar series that I think oh, you and there's a workshop, a school-wide improvement oh. leadership workshop series. Nice. Um, the, we pushed the date back to give an opportunity for more people to join. Um, and I don't know if Patrice knows the date, she can put it in the chat, but it is going to be using that SIC that we started to talk about today and using it to um, apply to our systems and design with UDL and all of those places and spaces. So we'll take time to set ourselves up for success, think about what our readiness indicators are for UDL implementation. We'll take some time to really look at baseline data, what, what's going on on the ground, what do we wanna use UDL to address and then we'll start to talk about how to, to have little small tests of change and start to codify those changes to really provide access and agency for teachers, learners, um, and leaders, all adults in the building. Wonderful. Sounds awesome. Yes, all right. Well, thank you for has... joining us. Melissa, I'm so glad our Wi-Fi held up, friend. I know. It was, it was a close call, folks. It was a close call. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. It was great all to right. be with you. Take care from whatever pocket of the world you're in.